All right. Uh, thank you, everyone, for for being here. So we're going to be having a debate today related to the resurrection, and the um, the resolution for today's debate is going to be resolved that the resurrection of Jesus from the dead is the most reasonable conclusion given the available evidence. So to start, we will have Hugh, who is going to give us a five minute introduction starting now. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Come Holy Ghost, come by means of the powerful intercession of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, your well-beloved spouse. In the name of Jesus, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. I'll be speaking about the prophecies and miracles of our Lord Jesus Christ as witnesses to his passion, death, and resurrection. In the Old Testament scriptures, there are hundreds of predictions that were fulfilled in the life, passion, and death of our Lord. Um, in Isaiah, we see that Isaiah predicts that our Lord will be a God-man, something quite singular. And already in Genesis, we're told that he will be of a specific lineage. And then Isaiah tells us that he will be of the house of Jesse, which becomes the house of David. The prophet Micah tells us that he will be born in a specific place in Bethlehem. Isaiah tells us that he will be born of a virgin, that he will do many miracles, including giving sight to the blind, something that nobody has done in the entire history of the world up until the coming of our Lord. And King David, a thousand years before the birth of Christ, prophesies the circumstances of his crucifixion in great detail, foretells the piercing of his hands and feet, the casting of lots for his clothes, the offering of gall and vinegar to him on the cross, that not one of his bones will be broken in spite of the piercing of his hands and feet, even the words that he speaks from the cross, quoting Psalm 31. And of course, our Lord predicts that he will be crucified, that he will rise again on the third day. And this is, we see a record of it in the Holy Shroud, as Jim will explain. The blood on the, on the shroud is post-mortem blood. And this shows that the image had to be imposed on the uh, shroud after the dead man came to life. But I want to focus on the uh, Eucharistic miracles that our Lord has worked continually over the last 2,000 years, which confirm his power to bring life from non-life, as he did in the work of creation in the beginning, as he did in his glorious resurrection, and as he does in his Eucharistic uh, presence today. So there are 153 church-approved Eucharistic miracles, and a number of these clearly demonstrate that our Lord Jesus Christ has this divine power, this supernatural power, to bring life from non-life. Uh, for example, in 1996, in uh, Buenos Aires, there was a consecrated host that was dropped on the ground. It was put in water to reverently dissolve it, and then it uh, began to bleed. So it was given by the church authorities to a very uh, famous histopathologist, Dr. Robert Lawrence, who examined it and said that it was the tissue of an inflamed heart, a human heart, which had been under great stress. Uh, this doctor then took it to one of the world's leading experts in cardiac pathology, Dr. Frederick Zugibe of Columbia University, gave it to him without telling him what it was. And Dr. Zugibe confirmed that it was a heart muscle, uh, myocardium, and that it was taken from somebody who was in uh, suffering uh, extreme pain. And when Dr. Zugiebe asked uh, Dr. Lawrence who was the source of this tissue, he was told that it came from a consecrated host. And Dr. Zugiebe said, I don't believe it. When you brought me that sample, that heart was alive. And in Sokolka, Poland, almost the same time, a uh, consecrated host began to bleed. And the church authorities gave this uh, to two different medical experts who confirmed that this was tissue from a human heart experiencing the agony of death as if on the point of cardiac arrest. Now, we not only see our Lord bringing life from non-life in the Holy Eucharist, we see him working the same miracles that he worked when he walked the earth through the Holy Eucharist as when Madame Beret, who had a, uh, a non-functioning optic nerve, went to Lourdes, totally blind, permanently blind, according to the doctors, 
And in the Eucharistic procession, she was given back her sight, even though when the doctors examined her, she did not have a functioning optic nerve. And so we see that the, uh, the Eucharistic miracles approved by the church demonstrate that our Lord who created all things in the beginning still brings life from non-life on every Catholic altar in the world and works the miracles that he wor worked when he walked the earth 2,000 years ago. Alleluia. Okay. All right. You? Thank you. All right. So, Jim, now you have 15 minutes starting now. Sure. Well, because we're a body and a soul, I'm not going to limit this just to, to science alone, but the, the goal is to unite truth with the human heart. And, and when we do that, I think we can experience joy because the, the deepest longing of the human heart is to know God. And when we nurture that desire with the way we live, we experience the true joy. Uh, because if we lack in the fullness of truth, we lack in the fullness of joy and living. And, and what is the truth? That, that only God can satisfy our, our deepest longings. And I can think of no better example of the consistency between logic and reason and faith than what we observe with the Shroud of Turin. And for the, the uh, information I'll be sharing with you and our audience, that the two sources, principal ones, are uh, the critical summary of data, hypotheses, and observations on the Shroud by uh, Dr. John Jackson of the United States Air Force Academy, and also the Shroud Library from Shroud.com to, uh, to uh, back up you know, all these facts here. And good science survives the test of time. And the Shroud is an example of this. In 1898, when the first photograph of the Shroud was taken by Segunda Pia, people looked at that picture and, and they just couldn't believe it was real. They thought it was a fraud. And for some 30 years, there were people that believed that way. And then in 1931, the shroud was shown again because it was displayed for the marriage of uh, King uh, Umberto II. And Henri took those pictures. And the pictures he took of the shroud, photographic negative, showed the same thing. That, gee, this picture taken by Segunda P is not a fraud. It, it really does produce this, three, this 3D image that we later find in, in the photographic negative. And then, of course, in 76 uh, or 78, uh, this is the picture taken by my friend Barry Schwartz that, with better photography, and it shows, you know, even more to that. So uh, what I'm, a point I'm making here is that when, when something is doubted, as, as many times hypotheses are, one of two things is going to happen. It's either going to get weaker with time and fade away, or it'll get stronger and gain credibility. And the shroud continues to gain strength. Uh, over time, as as recognized by numerous scientists that have been converted, there were scientists from the Sturt team in 1978 that were converted as a result of studying the shroud. They, were, they came in skeptical and came out believers. Not all of them, but but many of them did. Uh, Dr. Augustin Aceta was an atheist who now heads the Turin Shroud Center of Southern California, <clears throat> and there are others. But, but when we were at, right along here, when when the Sturt gave their conclusions in 1981. These 33 scientists, and only three of them are Catholic, by the way. So more than 90% of these scientists were not Catholic, right? Um, they published their data for the next three years in professional scientific peer-reviewed journals, and they couldn't answer the question how the image was formed. Uh, however, they did state these three facts that are still true today, all right? Number one, there are no pigments, paints, or dyes that make up, that are found on that Im the image-bearing fibers. There's, there's simply nothing there to make up the image. It's simply there in an inexplainable way. And for that reason and others, it's not the work of an artist uh, because of superficiality and 3D that we'll get into later. Then there's 15 other traits that the artist theories cannot satisfy either. Um, and then thirdly, this is not a natural process. The, otherwise, we, we could reproduce this or we could find these all over the place. So it, it's a one of a kind. And so my, my point here for our audience is that when you don't have to debate uh, necessarily, you simply share the facts and let the facts speak for themselves. And I think reasonable people will come to a, a reasonable conclusion on that. Um, regardless of what ensues over the next hour or so, those three facts that are proven that this is not the work of an artist or a natural process will remain. And it's logical to come to a conclusion that if all the natural means have been ruled out, you know, what is left? Uh, I think we all believe in, in what's called cause and effect. You know, every effect has a cause. The image on the shroud is an effect, and something caused that. And because it, it does not appear to be something natural, we attribute it to the resurrection, which is supernatural. And I think logic and reason are consistent with that. 
Um, the Shroud research, Joseph Marino has cataloged the scientific papers of over 1,000 different scientists from the last century. And by an eight to one margin, uh, they too support the contention in supporting that the shroud is the authentic burial cloth of Christ by an eight to one margin. And uh, the majority of these are not necessarily Catholic. Uh, sometimes doubters will say, well, we, we just haven't figured it out yet, but someday we will, all right? Uh, this, that this was somehow done by some trickery and we can now reproduce it. But we've had a century of investigating these beginning back in 1930, with uh, Vignon's uh, theory about it. It was a gas emitted from the body to produce this picture. And even he rejected that hypothesis after further study. And every other hypothesis since that time, and there have been 10 that have been published in scientific theory of uh, journals, uh, every one of those have also have been shown to be inadequate to produce all the features that we see on the shroud. Uh, things like, you know, is a painting or maybe someone invented photography in the 13th century. Uh, the shroud was tested for silver nitrate. There's no silver nitrate on the shroud that a photographer would have used. However, they have zeroed in on the idea of a radiation event. Some type of radiation event is the only area of serious research today that attempts to answer that question, how was the image formed? How many more centuries of, of failed hypotheses and unten untenable arguments will it take before to concede to the reality that to admit that perhaps this image really is supernatural. Now, I, I mentioned uh, radiation, and this was studied more recently by, recently by the Italian Atomic Energy Agency at the University there at Padua, and they found that in order to produce that superficial uh, yellowing at a very faint level, it would require uh, basically every laser on Earth focused on that surface area for 40 nanoseconds. And of course, a nanosecond is one one billionth of a second. If you go any longer than that, it just burns a hole into it. And we, we simply don't have the technology to take every laser and get them in one spot to do that these days. Imagine trying to do it, you know, centuries ago. Uh, regarding superficiality, the faintness of this image, do you know how deep that goes? It goes two tenths of one micron. And the shroud itself is one third of a millimeter thick, which is the same diameter as the smallest string on a guitar. And I just happen to have one here. And this last little string here, the number six string right above my index finger, that's what one third of a millimeter looks like. So that's the thickness of the shroud material. Now that one little thread is made up of anywhere from 70 to 120 little microscopic fibrils. And if we try and imagine how deep does this penetrate, any liquid, like for instance, the blood and the water stains penetrate all the way through those threads and just by, by a natural capillary action. But the image on the, the shroud is so faint that it penetrates to two tenths of one micron. Now there's a thousand microns in a millimeter and this yellowing only affects the uppermost cell wall layer of the uppermost single microscopic fibrils, two tenths of one one thousandth of one millimeter. And that, that trait alone has eliminated all artist possibilities as, as well as the, uh, the 3D image. So let's, we're done talking about superficiality. I, I'd like to address a second issue that Shroud has shown us. And that is in 1976, that picture that I showed earlier uh, when I was talking with Dan here, this picture was placed under a NASA instrument called the VP-8 image analyzer. And the VP-8 was developed by NASA because they wanted to map the back surface of the moon. See, the same side of the moon is always facing us and they wanted to map the back side. And this instrument, the VP-8, is sensitive to light intensities. So they can measure the valleys and hills based on the light intensities. But pictures don't contain light intensity information. Pictures like you're looking on your screen right now contain shapes and colors. And under the VP8, they actually get worse. But with the shroud, that very faint image jumped out at them to produce this 3D image of the green face. You've all seen that, so I won't take time to show that with a screen share. And that, that uh, 3D image showed that there was a perfect correlation between the cloth, the body distance at the moment the image was formed, which means that the cloth was touching the, the tip of the nose, obviously, it was touching the cheeks and the beard. And those areas were more raised because there was a greater light intensity. The eyes were closed and they were a couple millimeters behind the cloth and they, they didn't show that raised feature. And this went for the entire body from head to toe. Uh, and so the feature of what we call 3D 
nature of the shroud makes it unique along with the superficiality. Those are things that we, we cannot reproduce. As a matter of fact, there, there are actually 17 traits on the shroud that have been analyzed. Six of them have to do with the cloth characteristics and 11 of them have to do with the image characteristics. And I just covered two. I don't have time to cover all 17. And one other thing to give you an idea of just how much this has been studied, uh, the researcher Joseph Marino, who's been doing this his whole life, he's devoted more than 40 years of his life to this, working on it every day. He has discovered some uh, 101 different academic disciplines that have gone into the shroud, all right? And he has pages of them here. I won't read them all to you, but you know, archeology, span art history, atomic resolution, botany, paleography, 101 scientific and academic disciplines have converged to study on this. And we, I don't think we find another study, even King Tut's tomb that, that nearly approaches that. And all of these are coherent with, with uh, the evidence we've had on the shroud. So the, the bigger question I wanna finish up here with, um, so I've given just a couple of things about the shroud that, that uh, those three facts about that it's not the work of an artist and we can't reproduce it, the, the superficiality of it, and the other factors. The bigger question I'd have for our friends to consider is how, how is it you came to it at one time that you were a believer, uh, perhaps, and then and then somehow, for whatever reason, there was disbelief? Because to me, I, I would sincerely like to understand your, your, your thinking on this, Brandon, because uh, we had such a nice, candid conversation the other day, and I, I wondered what disillusioned you that took you the other direction. And I'm under time, but I'm going to stop right now and turn it over to you. All right. So... Um, we can use if, if if you'd like. Would you would you be willing to use the remainder of your time to have a little back and forth, and then we can move on to Brendan's opening statement? Well, I would like to not defer time to give away. I would just like to keep with the schedule. And if we okay. finish number two like we did now, we move right into number three. Okay, sure. Or excuse so me, the, number two. Yeah. We're on number two. Have you got a list of this, Brendan? Yeah. Number one was our state our statement. Then opening statement number two is you there. So I'm ready to move on to number two. And, and I, I don't know if you received the updated um, structure, but we, we modified it a little bit, and we actually have number two is, is a cross-examination. So, um, oh, okay. so so Brendan will ask you, uh, Brendan has five minutes to ask you a series of short questions, and you can give some short answers. And yeah, I thought that, that was we'll rebuttal one. You're just changing the order? Because I thought he was going to get a chance to speak for 15 minutes. Yeah, um, his um, his 20-minute opening statement will be after the cross-examination, and then you will have five minutes to cross-examine him after his opening statement. So, okay. yeah. Um, okay, great. So so we can begin the cross-examination. Um, and Brendan, you have five minutes for that starting now. Sure, yeah. And, and the cross-examination is primarily just to help uh, understand some of the sources of research and uh, set the stage. So <clears throat> uh, the first question I have with cross-examination, uh, when was the last time the Shroud was able to actually be physically taken and observed, uh, studied in any capacity. Oh, you want me to answer that now or wait till you... Uh, yeah, 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 if you don't mind. Okay, 1978 was the last time. And then in 1988, there was a minor testing of just one test, the carbon dating. Yeah. And then in 2002, there was a restoration. So only twice since that time has that happened. So there really, yeah. would, it would be nice if we could do another study. We're probably in agreement yeah. on that. Uh, so 2002 was the restoration, but there was no study done, pieces taken. It was just, they restored it and that was that was it. Right, but there had actually been some other carbon datings done, maybe you didn't know about. In Texas, uh, Valdez Garcia had a thread from the ray sample that was about this long. And one end of that thread tested out to be about 1200 AD and four inches away, it was 400 AD. So that yeah, a single thread can't be 800 years <laughs> but being formed. So obviously there's contamination problems that haven't been addressed. Sure. Um, okay. And then I think that's about uh, all I have as far as the cross-examination. There weren't a, a lot of points gone over, so I didn't have a lot of questions uh, needing addressing on that. Okay. All right, great. So um, in that case, we will move on. <clears throat> to your opening statement. So now you have 20 minutes starting now. All right, so the topic of tonight is uh, the resurrection and whether or not the available evidence is consistent with a uh, resurrection account, whether or not the resurrection account is the most uh, explanatory uh, 
explanation that we have for that evidence. So uh, when we're looking at something like this, right, whenever a historian is looking at uh, a, uh, a textual uh, event, any sort of historical event, right, you have the claim that's being made, uh, you have evidence to support that claim. Uh, and so the claim as we have it is that uh, in the first century, there was a Jewish man, the Jewish man uh, came, worked miracles, uh, died, and rose again from the dead. We, the source of this claim comes to us from the New Testament, specifically from the gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, although it is alluded to in Acts and in the letters of Paul. Um, so if we're going to examine the resurrection, uh, and I will spend a little bit of time at the end addressing specifically prophecies and the shroud, but if we're going to uh, examine the resurrection and try and, and understand whether or not this was a historical event, uh, the first thing we should do is examine the sources. Uh, where is this claim coming from? And we find, I think, just by examining the sources that right off the bat, we have major issues with this claim. Uh, the, uh, so Bible scholars who have researched all of this tell us that uh, the letters of Paul came before the Gospels. That's pretty uncontroversial. Uh, the letters of Paul came before the Gospels, the letters of Paul in around the 40s, 50s, uh, maybe as late as 60s. The, the Gospels seem to be around the 70s. Uh, and within the letters of Paul, we have the Corinthian Creed. So the first attestation that we actually have for the resurrection of Jesus is this creed. Now, we don't know where the creed comes from. We don't know how much further back it goes. Uh, but the creed simply says Jesus rose from the dead and he appeared to, and it lists several groups, uh, including uh, Paul adds at the end, last of all, as one untimely born myself. So that's the earliest attestation that we have for the resurrection. It tells us absolutely nothing except Jesus Christ rose from the dead. We don't know where it comes from. We don't know uh, who's making it. We don't know uh, whether or not uh, it was verified by anyone. The second, uh, and it occurs uh, as late as uh, 10 to 20 years after Jesus's death. Now, the next attestation we have, the only time, or the first time we actually get a full resurrection story is in the Gospel of Mark. The Gospel of Mark appears some 40 years after Jesus' death and uh, supposed resurrection. Uh, we also have Matthew and Luke. The problem is Matthew and Luke are just Mark with commentary. Uh, they add their own perspectives. They add different pieces of information. They also copy and paste Mark. Uh, verbatim, in fact, uh, in places from the Greek. So not just a, we're telling the same story, and so it sounds similar, but I am using the exact same wording in Greek, which occasionally includes dialogue, which is especially funny because they would have written in, or spoken in Aramaic. So Mark leads to Matthew and Luke. There's also good scholarly evidence suggesting that John at least had access to Mark uh, and potentially one of the other Gospels, right? So we don't have four separate attestations of the resurrection. We don't have any evidence for who wrote these Gospels. Church tradition puts them as Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, ironically, with the book of Matthew, uh, the call of Matthew, the moment in which Jesus calls Matthew, is one of those pe uh, passages that's copied and pasted. You would think if it was written by Matthew, Matthew would tell the story of him being called by Jesus himself and not just copy and paste it from someone else. Uh, we don't know who wrote them. We don't know exactly when they were written. Uh, our earliest manuscripts are 100 plus years from when they were written. Um, and even then are tiny. The earliest fragment we have is smaller than the size of a credit card. Uh, we don't know. Uh, you know, with what we do have, we know that there are textual issues. For instance, we don't know for sure that the ending of the book of Mark is consistent, uh, right? So there are, uh, and, oh, and then within the Gospels, we have issues, right? Matthew seems to claim that a prophecy exists, that he shall be a Nazarene, and yet we have no such prophecy in the Old Testament. Matthew claims that the uh, that there's a prophecy for uh 
the virgin birth, which we know to be from a mistranslation of the Hebrew and the Greek Septuagint, the Hebrew didn't say virgin, the Hebrew said young woman. The Greek said virgin, and Matthew took that and ran with it, right? So we have these issues with the gospel accounts. They have these issues that make them difficult to take on their face as reliable historical documents, right? Number one, we don't have multiple accounts. We have Mark, and then we have others on top of that. Number two, we don't know who wrote any of them. Uh, and number three, they are significantly later than the actual events. Now, assuming that they are reporting from the actual events, even assuming that the gospel writers have eyewitnesses that they're talking to, we then also have the issues of memory. Right? Significant studies have been done on human memory. Uh, the, uh, one of the most interesting, personally, uh, was a study that was done on memories uh, after 9-11, in which people were asked within a few weeks after the towers collapsed where they were, what they were doing. Right? They, people who were in New York City, people who experienced this traumatic event firsthand. And then they were asked again a year from then, a year from then, right? 10 years. And the stories changed. They were not consistent. They did not stay the same. People's memories are incredibly faulty. And this has been proven time and time again. People's memories are faulty. People will remember themselves seeing things, talking to people, being at events that never even happened because word of mouth spreads. This is especially true when you are dealing with a time and place in which uh, there is high, or there's high tensions, a lot of fear, right? A lot of emotions that are coming in and clouding perception of reality. And especially when you're adding that to a culture that already is predisposed to believe this, or when you add suggestions that, uh, that these events may occur, that you might see this person, you might experience this thing, right? So when we look at the claims being made by the Gospels, they are at best, just on the surface, uh, difficult to take uh, at face value. Ancient documents generally are. Historians make whole careers off of contradicting and, and reinterpreting various historical documents. We don't take any ancient historians, any ancient historians at face value all the time. All ancient historians add elements of bias, miraculous stories that we wouldn't believe happen, right? If we're going to remain consistent with our uh, epistemology, we need to apply those same criteria to the gospel narratives. Uh, now, I personally believe that because Christianity did come from somewhere, I believe that Jesus was a real figure, that he lived, that he was crucified. I believe that uh, people did have experiences that they attributed afterwards to a resurrected Jesus. And I believe that those can easily be explained by any number of natural phenomenon. Uh, including uh, simply a uh, post-bereavement hallucination, right? Peter could have just been so grieved that he legitimately thought that he saw a resurrected Jesus. Uh, there are plenty of stories of things like this uh, that have occurred, where people see people, they tend to appear suddenly in rooms that they didn't walk into, they disappear at the end of the, this after a short period of time, Right? Very characteristic of some of the resurrection stories we do see from the later Gospels. If that's the case, a very sincere but mistaken Peter starting to tell the stories could easily then have that influence of people then wanting to see this resurrected Jesus could easily start to become people thinking that they see a resurrected Jesus, people attributing things like random conversations with people on the road to a resurrected Jesus, even though they definitely didn't think it was him while the conversation was occurring. Right? All of these are very common phenomena that match the data. So if that's the case, then we have this very clear naturalistic phenomenon. But even, even besides that, into what, what I would consider a more unlikely scenario in which the apostles simply 
lied about Jesus being raised from the dead. This is still a much more likely situation than the idea of an actual resurrection, right? We see this all the time. We have a plethora of world religions and even some denominations, offshoots of world religions that were caused uh, by people lying, making things up for one reason or another, perhaps getting caught up in the lie, sometimes even dying for the lie. Uh, Joseph Smith died because of uh, his connections to the Mormon faith, because of his starting of the Mormon faith, right? So we have a plethora of examples from uh, our natural experience world that give us a, a, a multitude of reasons that could have started Christianity, none of which necessitate an actual physical resurrection. And I contend that if Jesus was resurrected by a good, all-powerful God, if he himself was a good, all-powerful God, and he wanted us to know him, especially if a just and good God wants to punish us if we cho uh, choose not to accept him, that there are a multitude of ways in which, uh, even without stretching credulity, this event could have been more accurately recorded, more accurately uh, presented to us. Uh, I mean, the Bible could glow every time we open it to show that it is a of uh, celestial and uh, holy origins. And yet we don't have that. What we do have are four Gospels that are problematic at best. Uh, and potentially contradictory, and that's a, an issue I'm not going to get into in this talk, um, right, that are written later by people we don't know, we don't have any of the original manuscripts, we don't have anything earlier than that except for a brief mention by Paul, and even the mention by Paul is later than the actual event. It seems as if, if we are going to go with the most likely and the most... Um, yeah, if we're going to go with the most likely uh, excuse or reason here for all of this to occur, we have a plethora of naturalistic reasons that don't require any sort of supernatural invention uh, for the resurrection. Uh, now, specifically talking briefly with what time I have left uh, on prophecy and on the shroud, uh, for prophecy, uh, the uh, so there are two types of prophecies that were mentioned. You have the Old Testament and you have the New Testament. Uh, the big issue with the Old Testament prophecy is that for a number of them, you won't even know they're prophecies until the gospel writer says that they're prophecies. You'll read a Psalm of David, and that Psalm of David mentions something that the gospel writer thinks matches pretty well with something that occurs in the gospel narratives, and so. He declares that that was a prophecy that Jesus fulfilled, even though none of the other psalms and none of the rest of the psalm is prophetic. And even though just reading the psalm, you wouldn't consider it to be a prophecy. You also have issues with those prophecies where the context surrounding the prophecy in absolutely no way matches Jesus. You have to cherry pick verses Pull them out of context. Uh, a good example of this is the prophecy of the young woman giving birth, right? First of all, in the Hebrew, it says a young woman. They have a word for virgin. They don't use it. They say a young woman. A young woman will give birth to a child, and uh, he shall call his name Emmanuel. And then it goes on to say that before he is old enough to eat, these things will happen, right? Before he is, uh, like, he is going to only know this diet. He is going to see all of these things that I am prophesying about. And the things he's prophesying about are uh, occurring in the reign in which he is prophesying. He is not talking in context about some future Messiah. He is talking about a woman giving birth to a child who is going to see the fall of the empire that he is prophesying to. It is only by removing it from context 
that you can then stretch that to be a prophecy about Jesus. That's a very common tactic that we see within early Jewish, uh, uh, not early Jewish, but uh, first century Jewish rhetoric. Uh, but it in no way means that if you read through that passage in any sort of straightforward sense, you can get this prophecy out of it. After that, a number of other prophecies are incredibly vague, or it seems as if there are instances where the uh, gospel writers themselves make up stories in order to make him fit a prophecy. For instance, being born in Bethlehem, Matthew and Luke seem to have both known about that prophecy and made up stories, stories that in fact seem contradictory based off of what history we have outside of the Gospels, right? Uh, the, uh, one of them takes place during the reign of Herod. Herod persecutes Jesus and massacres a bunch of children. The other one takes place during the census of Quirinius. That's what brings them to Bethlehem to begin with. The problem is that the external sources tell us that Quirinius becomes governor specifically to liquidate Herod's estate years after Herod dies, right? They seem contradictory, but they make sense if we remove this idea that they must be the inspired word of God telling a consistent narrative and instead understand them like we would any other ancient document. Both of these people have a prophecy about Bethlehem that they have to address. Both of them add to the story a reason why it actually happened in Bethlehem, even though we all know that the guy is from Nazareth. Uh, now, uh, New Testament prophecy, similar, right? When you write a story about a guy 40 years after he dies, it's really easy to insert things that that guy may or may not have said while he was still alive. That's narrative trick. If you're writing a book in which you know what's going to happen to a character, you can insert prophecies about that character. Um, and then lastly, uh, just briefly on the shroud, uh, unfortunately, it has not been physically examined since 1978. We still didn't know how the Romans made concrete at the time. That becomes, uh, that's actually a fairly modern uh, discovery, right, with modern technology and modern inventions. We've not been able to examine the shroud since 1978. With our modern technology, we may find that some pieces of that initial uh, investigation were incorrect or inconclusive. Uh, the problem is we just can't examine it. We've not been allowed to. But what we have been allowed to do is carbon test the sample in 1988. 1988 a sample was cut out and sent to three different labs. Two of the three labs found within the exact same uh, date range that it was indeed a medieval forgery as the earliest attestation of the shroud attests that it was. Uh, and one of, uh, and uh, the third, Oxford, uh, Oxford's carbon dating labs, came up with a date range that was 88 years from being exactly spot on, but 10 years from still having an overlap, right? So there is a discrepancy between those dates. However, an examination of how these three labs cleaned their samples found that Oxford cleaned their samples in a slightly different way that we know now to be better at being able to get particulate uh, and, and uh, contamination out. In fact, we also know that all it would take is point 7% of a contaminant in the sample for the Oxford lab um, to be 10 years off from the others, right? That's not even observable under a microscope. It seems conclusive between the three major labs that did the tests that this is indeed medieval and could absolutely not be from the first century. Uh, and with that, I end my closing argument. All right, thank you. So just an overview of what we have remaining for the rest of the debate. Um, the, the next one will be a cross-examination. So Jim, you can ask Brendan a series of questions for five minutes, and then we will have um, your rebuttal. So you will have another five minutes after that to, um, to make a statement. And then we're going to have a series of three um, sets of rebuttals back and forth. And then the closing statement at the end will also be um, uh, five minutes. So each of the rebuttals will be five minutes each, and then a closing statement will be five minutes each. So 
Um, so Jim, you have five minutes to ask Brendan some questions beginning now. Just sure. one, just one thing, if I could. Um, sure. Jim, if if you uh, after you've taken this one, if you would like to let me take the next one, we could go back and forth since Brenda didn't speak very much about the Holy Shroud. <laughs> sure. Sure. Okay. All right. All right. I'll begin my five minutes now. I think Brendan's questions have to do with credibility in two areas, the credibility of the Bible and the credibility of the science on the shroud. And so I'll address the credibility on the science and I'll let you handle the credibility on, on the Bible. Uh, the fact that uh, 70, the 78 findings are still holding up actually reinforces the point I was trying to make that uh, good science survives the test of time. And everything they found in 1978 is just as true today as it was 40 years ago. Uh, regarding the 1988 carbon dating test, that sounds like information from Wikipedia, which has not been updated on this. And what happened was in uh, 2017, Tristan Casabianca sued Oxford because they did not publish the raw data in their original paper in 1989. There was no raw data. And so by law, they had to cough it up. And as it turns out, Dr. Robert Rucker of Washington State has analyzed the raw data and he found some data manipulation. They threw out the highs and lows. They actually cut it into 16 pieces and they took pairs of pieces and averaged them, making it appear that this was one reading of consistency. Uh, that's called data manipulation. That's just as kindly as I can put it. And Wikipedia uh, doesn't have that. But Dr. Robert Rucker's paper does. You can find it on shroud.com. Regarding uh, this testing. Wait, wait, I'm still going to finish my time, please. Uh, I, I was going to ask, is this a cross-examination in which we're going back and forth, or is this a rebuttal? I thought yeah. I got five minutes. Yeah, this yeah this is a five minute cross examination. If you'd like to use it as just five minutes to uh, speak, then that's fine. Sure. And the carbon dating yeah. test uh, that uh, there have been four other modern tests since then using modern technology. So I'm glad you brought that up. Since in 2014, Professor Julia Fonte described three of these tests where they took infrared lights, lasers, and tensile strengths, and those modern tests all with with raw data uh, shown coincided. Uh, with a within an acceptable deviation range of 95%. They're 95% certain that that was not a uh, significant deviation. Then there's been a fourth test that came out in 2021, the wide angle x-ray scatter. And the wide angle x-ray scatter waxes also confirmed. So the four modern dating tests on the shroud, uh, they actually uh, confirm a first century age and along with this, on the cloth itself, there have been some studies using threads from the ray sample. And there's a, wee, there's a particular cut up along the shroud where it had been torn, up, had been torn off and then sewn back on. This was a long strip used to wrap the body, later sewn back on. There's a very unique stitching pattern that's only been found once in history. And this is the work of uh, Professor Mitchell Fleury Lemberg, a textile uh, expert from Europe. And this, this uh, particular stitching pattern was found in an earthen jar from Masada. And it was uh, very well preserved and reliably dated to the first century. And that same stitching pattern that we see on the shroud is exactly the same, never found in history before. So we find these two stitching patterns that match up from the first century, along with four carbon, uh, four other modern dating techniques. Uh, the, the waxes has been around since 2017. The other three have been around for about a decade or so. So carbon dating is still used, but these modern tests are not subject to the problems of contamination. And carbon dating has, car has contamination problems. 20% of all carbon dating results are tossed aside and discarded because of contamination. So in, in terms of answering the credibility uh, regarding the shroud, I think I've covered those. And I would like to throw a question back to you regarding the Bible, and that there, there was a time, Brendan, where, where, you know, the Bible was something that you, you did believe, and you went to Mass, and it was credible to you then. What happened to make it so it's not credible to you now? That's the end of my time. I'll, I'll, I'll freely give up another five minutes. That's my five minutes is up there. Um, Brendan, you can go ahead and answer that, because the cross-examination has one minute left. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, so specifically, uh, am I answering all of it or just the, why is the Bible not credible? I'm just, whatever you can in one minute. What changed your thinking on the Bible? Okay. Um, <laughs> studying it. Uh, specifically, I started with, uh, well, 
it started. I, I it was all very jumbled, but uh, studying it uh, and studying the research uh, surrounding it, right? So like. Uh, the research on the Old Testament, right? The very clear uh, fact that we don't have uh, a literal exodus happening at the time that it, the Bible says that it happened, which it contradicts itself when it says it happened anyways, or in the way that it says it happens, it can't possibly happen with the number of people that said it happened. The archaeological finds that we have on the conquest of Canaan make it very clear that the conquest of Canaan didn't happen. Um, prophecies in uh, the Old Testament don't happen. Right, we have uh, like it's the Old Testament is just not reliable. It doesn't get much better when you get to the New Testament, except for the fact that the New Testament is shorter with a lot fewer authors, so it makes it uh, a lot harder to uh, and it makes a lot fewer specific claims. It just kind of repeats the same story. Uh, and that's but yeah, stunning, stunning the Bible. All right, so um, now that, that's the end of the cross examination for uh, Jim and Hugh, and now. We have uh, five minutes for a rebuttal from Jim and Hugh. So um, Hugh, if you'd like to take this, you may, or if Jim, you would like to talk for another five minutes either way. I'll turn it to you. Oh, if there's a minute left, I'll get in, but go ahead, you. All righty. So um, I just like to point out that there's um, something about your modus operandi, Brendan, that I think should be reflected upon. If we look at the shroud, um, Jim has presented some remarkable evidence that coheres and it points to the authenticity of the shroud as the burial cloth of Jesus. You can consider the fact that in recorded history, uh, there isn't any other record of a, a, a person who was crucified, scourged in the way that our Lord is described as being scourged in the gospel, crowned with thorns and given a wound in his side. Uh, if you can think of another one, please let us know, but um, <laughs> I don't know of any such person in recorded history, and yet all of those characteristics are recorded in, in the Shroud. And this is quite remarkable. Jim's mentioned four modern dating methods that are not subject to the obvious contamination that took place with the material that was used to date the Shroud material that was used to repair the shroud and that had been uh, subjected to an area in an area that had been subjected to fire, which is a, 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 an obvious cause of contamination. So you've basically disregarded a huge amount of evidence from many different scientific disciplines that points to the authenticity of the shroud that is associated with a person who's absolutely unique in history for the reasons that I gave. And you're using this one uh, test that's been totally discredited to simply dismiss all of the other evidence. And I would just uh, urge you to try not to operate that way because you do the same thing with the biblical evidence. Let me give you an example. You say that virgin is an obvious mistranslation of Alma, but that is completely false. If you look through all the places in the Old Testament where Alma is used, it is never used of a woman who has sexual relations. What's more, the Septuagint was the Bible of the Greek-speaking Jews in the time of Jesus. And Greek was the lingua franca of the entire Roman Empire. So when Parthenos is used to translate Alma, that is how it was understood universally by the Jewish community at that time. It's only subsequently that Jewish scholars who didn't accept Jesus as Messiah backed away but Parthenos gives you 
the interpretation of Alma that was universal among the Jews at the time of the coming of Jesus. And so there's another example where you've taken a position without really looking at uh, all the data. Even among what we would call modernist Bible scholars, there's also been in recent years a very strong movement, and these are modernists, <laughs> to uh, Costin Theed, Reginald Fuller, who was at Virginia Theological Seminary, even Bishop Robinson, all of these scholars have moved the dates for the composition of the Gospels to between 40 and 65 AD. So again, this it is simply inaccurate to claim that there's this universal consensus that the Gospels were not written until much later. Um, and with regard to the prophecies, like the prophecy in Micah chapter 5, verse 2, about the Messiah being born in Bethlehem, this is not some after-the-fact uh, insertion into <laughs> the scriptures. Ten seconds This left. is something. Pardon me? Okay. Thank you. Uh, okay, I'm sorry. I didn't uh, understand. <laughs> if, if you'd like to just finish your sentence, that's fine. Oh, that's okay. It's, I'm done. Okay, so um, so Brendan, your rebuttal number one, which will be five minutes, begins now. Yeah. So uh, first, addressing the data from the shroud. Uh, first of all, I'm not pulling information from Wikipedia. I'm pull pulling information from studies that have been done, and specifically, I was looking at studies done post 2019. Uh, I wanted the most recent research. Um, in in fact, I, I listened to a talk given by Andrea Nicoletti, who is a uh, very well known Italian scholar on the shroud. It was translated by another well known scholar on the shroud, Andrew Casper, because Andrew, uh, sorry, Andrea Nicoletti uh, speaks Italian. Um, this was a year ago. Fully aware of all of the data, he said that conclusively he doesn't know of any scholars that uh, consider it to uh, consider the uh, carbon dating to be unreliable. Uh, however, the other tests that you mentioned, and then, uh, I'll only touch on two of the four because I'm not actually aware of the other two, uh, but I know that the X-ray scatter tests uh, is one that is incredibly new, has very little data supporting it, and seems to have been invented as a way to test the shroud, and then came up with the results of the first century for the shroud. Now, it's very possible that the X-ray scatter method is reliable. It's just it doesn't have the same data backing it that carbon testing does. So trying to say that I should hold these or that these stand on equal platforms and oh this one's been discredited even though it's not when these are equally reliable even when they're not that's not really genuine. Carbon dating has stood the test of time and modern scientists have supported that. Uh, even if there was some contamination, which I would assert that it seems obvious that there was for the fact that Oxford got a uh, slightly earlier date, uh, the cleaning methods of the Oxford sample were different. We know how they were different, and we know that the difference is very likely enough to have been able to provide, again, a 10-year gap, right? the amount of difference, the, the contamination you would have to have in the sample in order for the sample to have reflected or to actually mean first century when it says 13th century or 12th century is 60%, which can be seen under a microscope, which all three labs carefully did, as well as the uh, scholars who took the sample to begin with. So I'm not uh, ignoring some data while uh, favoring others. I am aware of all of the data I've looked very intently into this in preparation for the debate, and I find all arguments uh, that the uh, that we should throw out the uh, carbon dating to be completely unconvincing. And I have looked at the most modern, the most recent scholarship, including the 2017 study. Um, as far as uh, modus operandi on the uh, the Bible itself, and uh, oh. Yes, um, 
Yeah, so uh, the word Alma is used in the Bible six times. Um, no, sorry, uh, eight or nine times. It's not used very frequently. Um, but we know that Hebrew exists outside of the Bible. And scholars who have researched this have, have shown pretty conclusively, first, we do have instances in Hebrew of the word for virgin being used. We knew that we know that they have a word for virgin, right? Young woman could mean virgin, right? Young unmarried woman could mean a virgin, but it's not specifically a virgin. And that's kind of the problem is Hebrew did have a word that specifically meant virgin. When that's translated into the Septuagint, the Septuagint translation used the wrong form of the word. It's not the only time the Septuagint makes a mistake like that. Uh, we have other instances of the Septuagint not being accurate in comparison to something like the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, as far as, oh, and I should have written them down, there were other uh, points that you had made that I wanted to address. Um, but uh, no, my, my examination of the biblical texts has been uh, led by scholars in the field who are uh, experts on the topic, and I have done my best to look at both sides of all of these. And I just, I, oh, um, the other one, gospel uh, dating. Yes, you can find a couple of scholars who will date uh, Mark as early as 40. Uh, they don't seem to be doing so off of any sort of good premises, and most of the scholarly community disagrees with them. You can always find outliers. I can find scholars who will say that the earth is flat. That doesn't mean that they are using good historical methodology, and it doesn't mean that uh, we should take their word over the consensus of scholarship, which doesn't mean every scholar. It means the majority of scholars. Uh, the majority okay. of scholars have that later dating. That's time for your rebuttal. And then the schedule that we agreed to actually says that for rebuttal two, we're going to switch the order. So now, Brendan, you have five minutes um, and then and then we'll give five minutes to Hugh and Jim for their rebuttal number two. So beginning now. Oh, I tried to squeeze everything in. I forgot that we switched the order on that. Uh, we might have to revise that for a future debate. Um, but uh, all right, building off of building off of that idea, then continuing uh, with the reliability of. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, uh, so the, the scholarly dates for Mark, yes, you can find some that are, uh, that you can find some scholars that will say it was earlier. There's not many of them. Um, and we do start to get into one of the big issues uh, across the board, and I was wondering if this was going to come up. Um, and that is the difference between a scholar asserting an opinion and a, an official peer-reviewed work. Uh, Right, so there is, for instance, a, a botanist scholar who uh, published a book on the Shroud of Turin in which he takes pollen samples from the shroud and then uh, places them as an extinct species in Jerusalem. It's not peer reviewed. It's not peer reviewed for a very good reason because other professional botanists who have looked at this research have laughed it out of the room. You can't take pollen, except on very rare occasions, you can't take pollen and date it to a species. You can tell what family it's from. You can't tell a species, let alone make such a specific, accurate assertion that it is a particular species from a particular region, from a particular time frame. And there is a, there's a lot of this sort of thing, right? So you can have individuals assert, you can have even scholars assert things uh, all day long, going through uh, the official peer-reviewed process in which other scholars are able to check their work and respond to their work, though, makes a big difference. Um, and I did realize, actually, I'm glad for the little extra time because I realized I had forgotten to mention uh, the stitching pattern uh, because one of the things I wanted to mention was that, uh, according to Andrea Nicoletti, which, again, a uh, scholar who has published works that are very well known and renowned uh, on the shroud who operates in an Italian university near the shroud, uh, very specifically actually addressed the stitching pattern, saying that according to the research that he's seen, the stitching pattern is a medieval weave that is absolutely not 
uh, or that we have no evidence of being a first century weave. Um, I've heard scholars, uh, I have also heard assertions that um, the weave was a first century weave, but that the first century weave was replicated later uh, when a patch was made and that that patch is why the carbon dating tests were off. Uh, so I, I've literally, I've heard scholars say the weave was first century, the weave was definitely not first century, and the weave was both first century and not first century. Uh, I find the weave to be incredibly unconvincing as an argument. Um, even, even if I grant, uh, and I would need to see the study, but even if I grant that, yeah, that stitching pattern was found in the first century and hasn't been found anywhere else, that's not much of an assertion. Cloth doesn't survive in the archaeological record. Like, just cloth just generally doesn't survive. Saying that we don't have uh, a sample of something that's incredibly rare to find anyways is an argument from silence. It could very well be that that very pattern was used all throughout the ancient period, all the way up to, uh, you know, the uh, early modern period, and us only having one sample of it would still not even be surprising. Like, that's, that's because of how infrequently cloth is found. So, no, saying that because the stitching pattern matched something from the first century, um, which I have seen a textile expert who has talked about how actually some errors in the, uh, that have been found in the way that the uh, shroud was woven together indicates a particular device for the stitching pattern that is specifically medieval, right? I find it all to be unconvincing either way. The most convincing tried and true test that we have is the carbon dating. Carbon dating says it can't possibly be first century. All right, so uh, Jim, now your um, rebuttal number two, which will be five minutes, begins now. Okay, I'll, I'm kind of in reverse order here. Regarding the weave, Brennan, I think we're talking about two different things. There's the weave on the shroud called the three-in-one herringbone, okay? Mm -hmm. And that was found at the time of Christ and in the medieval times, but in medieval times, we only discovered the three-in-one three weave on wool. There was never ever found in Europe at any time, linen with a three-in-one three herringbone weave. So the three-in-one herringbone does date to Christ. The shroud is that they had a three-in-one in Europe during the Middle Ages, but it was only with wool and never with linen, okay? Uh, second question, uh, by the way, with, with uh, pollen grains, besides Max Fry, who was a Swiss criminologist, he's like a CSI guy, his work was du duplicated by other botanists. The most prominent one who we wrote a book on this was a Jewish botanist. His name is Avi Noam Dineen. And, and Avi Noam Dineen would, re, would refute your claim that the species of a pollen could not be recognized from the pollen grains. He spent his entire life living in uh, the, the Holy Land, and he could distinguish between different genuses and species. And so he would say that those, those pollen grains did uh, date uh, to the Jerusalem area. So uh, that's Avi Noam Dineen, if you want to look him up. He wrote a book on this. Uh, third point, um, why was the shroud contaminated? You know, when, when they did the carbon dating and the light, things did line up, what was the source of that carbon, that contamination? We honestly don't know. Three, three prospects have been put forward. One is that carbon monoxide levels are different at the ground than they are a few feet above it. And that could affect 14 centuries with just a 2% difference. That's Dr. Jackson's theory. Another theory is that there was a neutron flux from the body. That's Professor Robert Rucker out in Washington State. And then there was a third theory that perhaps that corner they sampled was a reweave of 16th century and first, se first century together. And that was Joseph Marino, Sue Benford, and Ray Rogers. So we don't have an answer to the question of what caused the contamination. Uh, but, but those things have been talked about. Also regarding the carbon dating test, uh, and this is not on Wikipedia, so I don't know if you've seen it, but you, you did mention me, you're looking at other sources. All right, I appreciate that. But that is, there were, there were 15 protocols violated and that carbon dating test. 15 protocols violated. The labs were communicating with each other. They did not have another sample to compare it with. It was valid. It's called a double blind test because they could not find a three in one herringbone weave linen anywhere in any museum or private collection other than the one jar that was uh, from Masada from the first century. 
And so these, these protocol violations, there were, there were 15 of them. These were uh, uh, enunciated in a paper by Pierre uh, de Carbon. You can look him up. Um, so th that's most unusual. And many, many scientists have weighed in on those, those violations that, uh, you know, they did things that normally don't happen. Uh, next, I want to address, you talked about Nicoletti, okay? Uh, Nicoletti said he doesn't know another scientist that, that, that uh, uh, doubts the carbon dating. That's not true. He is good friends with Emanuela Marinelli, Professor Emanuela Marinelli of Italy. She, she wrote a 30-page paper on the problems with the carbon dating test. It was written in 2012. You can read her paper. It's on shroud.com. And so he knows of other scientists that, that doubt the carbon dating. And so for him to say, ah, oh, but we all agree on it, it's just, just not true. Nicoletti and Garcelli. Garcelli is another Italian who did the test here about two years ago. You may have heard about it where he did a blood dropping test on a, on a mannequin and he put blood on it and said, well, it doesn't drain the way we see on the shroud, therefore the shroud is a fraud. There were numerous problems with that. And Dr. Jackson spent over a year researching that and gave a, a presentation to the American Forensics Academy at their, at their annual meeting, conclusively showing that. And other scientists did too. Basically, starting with the blood, what do you suppose Jesus's blood was like? If you were dehydrated, you've lost a lot of plasma. Your blood is thick. So the viscosity of his fake blood that he used was, was wrong to begin with. So, so the, the, the protocol that he used in his testing was, was found to be faulty. And, and Nicoletti and Garla Shelley have, have spent their lives trying to disprove the shroud. And they make big headlines every few years. And then after their, their misinformation is discredited, you don't hear about that. But my guess is we'll hear from them the next five years with another test they've come up with. I'll stop at that point. All right, so Brendan, your rebuttal number three begins now. Uh, yeah, so uh, point of clarification, I'm, I'm glad that you brought that up. Um, I, I misspoke. Uh, Nicoletti did not say that he, uh, that no other scientist has, uh, has questioned the, uh, the carbon dating. He, he did specifically say that no other uh, scientist in the field of carbon dating. No other expert on carbon dating has questioned the carbon dating. Um, I don't know Marinelli's reputation. I'd have to go and, and look to see what field uh, she operates in. Um, but uh, I that was a misspeak, and I do apologize for that. And so I provide that correction is that he did uh, couch his statement with uh, that none of them are experts in the field. Um, the Swiss botanist, I'm also happy to look into him. Uh, you'll have to give me his name afterwards. The spelling on it, the pronunciation made the spelling a little bit tricky on that. Uh, I am curious. <laughs> sure. Well, I am curious whether or not his work uh, has been peer reviewed, uh, but uh, more than happy to, uh, to look into that. Um, I just do not see any good reason to throw out the carbon dating. Uh, even with, even if there were the violations, which, uh, like, here's the thing, I, I'm being asked to take the word of the scientists who worked on, or who, who examined it in 1978, over the word of scientists who did the carbon dating in 1980, which include Oxford. Now, the scientists in 1978 were also highly reputable, definitely not questioning that. Uh, my issue is that I'm being told in one hand to not trust the scientists because of all of these errors that we're aware of. And then I'm being told on the other hand that look at all these scientists and all of these things that they're saying. Uh, and more specifically, um, actually, I want to go back to something that was mentioned to your bundles ago that I had forgotten to, to, to respond to. Um, one of the comments that was made earlier is that the science stands up, right? That uh, the, the study was done in 1978 and it stands up. Well, yeah, it's not hard for science to stand up to a lack of opposition, right? They've not taken the shroud out and done the same thing. They've not taken the shroud out and then run the same tests. They haven't uh, done the same thing that the 1978 group has done to confirm it, right? It's not about the shroud has stood up. It's about the shroud has not been allowed to be taken and studied. 
you had it come out in 1978 and then you had a carbon dating in 1988. And then after that, it's not really been touched except 2002 for restoration. That leaves a huge gap. We have so much uh, technology now that could be used to examine this. I'm saying that it stands up when there's not like an opposing study. It's not like they took it with modern technology did all of the same things and came to the same findings again. We are literally being presented with one argument. And now we are or with one set of data points. Now we are then finding explanations for the data points, uh, right? We are then being able to take that and try and extrapolate information from that, but we only have the one set of data points. It's a lot of data. They, they gathered a lot over five days. Um, and the team is phenomenal. Like I do not want to discredit or downplay the team. They are phenomenal researchers, uh, highly credentialed, and they knew what they were doing. I'm just wondering why this claim of it still stands keeps coming up when, again, there's not like there's opposition to it. There's not been another study with modern technology. It doesn't still stand. It's just all we've got. Um, <laughs> Otherwise, uh, oh, one thing I would like a little bit of clarification on. Um, you had mentioned, uh, you were talking about the stitching pattern. You mentioned that uh, there were two different things there. There's the, the three-in-one. Uh, you didn't, uh, I think, uh, either I didn't write it down or, or you might have uh, forgotten to finish that thought. I didn't get what the uh, difference between that and the stitching pattern tests that you brought up was. So uh, some clarification on that would be fantastic. I, I'd appreciate it. Right, sure. Yeah, I'm sorry I didn't clarify that better. There, there's the stitching pattern of the shroud itself, which is linen made of a three in bone herring bone weave. It's about 15 feet by four feet. That's the bulk of the shroud. The other stitching pattern I was talking about that's only been found in the first century one time is that there's a seam 14 feet long on the shroud in which we know the shroud has been removed, had been ripped off to use to wrap around the body, most likely, and then sewn back on. And that particular uh, repair, that repair type of stitch was only found. So does that, does that make a clarify for you? Yes, 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 yes. Thank you. The repair stitch, and then there's the three-in-one herringbone. Okay, good. All right. Well, uh, regarding some other things you talked about here, uh, I got to get my notes here. Um, hang on a second here. Oh, the... Uh, there has been some, some, some hands-on study with the shroud in 1988 with the carbon dating test. And at that time, because they didn't show the raw data, all right, that the carbon dating test was accepted. However, when the, when the raw data was released, we know now more than we knew then. If you look at the data, the actual data that, that was published uh, in 2019 from the Freedom of Information Law, the raw data that they withheld uh, has to be substituted subject to what's called the chi-square test. And a chi-square test means you can have variation. You know, if I flip a coin 100 times, could I get 53 heads and 47 tails? Yeah, that could happen. That's called acceptable deviation. Could I flip that coin and get 99 heads and one tail? The odds of that are two to the 99th power. And that's called significant deviation. So when they looked at the data, raw data, when I talked about the manipulated data in terms of how they averaged some things and, and got rid of others, the, the raw data shows significant deviation that the, the chi-square value is 1.04%. And this is Ernesto Bernardi, who is an engineer in Italy. An acceptable deviation happens at 5%. And so the chi-square value on their data is unacceptable. And, and that is an objective mathematical scientific probability that's accepted around the world. It's not debatable. If the, if the data that they got shows significant deviation, then you toss that out. And that happens with 20% of carbon dating tests. And that is the work of uh, Bill Meekham, uh, University of Hong Kong. And so I guess in, in answering your question about uh, touches in 78, the 1988 tests did. And now that we got the data from that, we, we know that there was some, some uh, significant deviation that invalidated. And the majority of scientists that I'm aware of uh, don't look at the carbon dating test anymore because of that. Now, with Nicoletti and Garlicelli, their friends in Italy, they think, oh, we're fine with this. All the carbon labs agree with them. That, that's not necessarily so. The seven labs that were, that were originally supposed to be a part of that carbon dating test 
four of them were bumped out. They're all out of business because this was a prestige item to be carbon dating. And Oxford and Zurich and Tucson, Arizona survived because of the credibility they got in getting to date. They were the chosen who got to uh, uh, date the shroud. And in this is another piece of, of common knowledge uh, that I'm not passing gossip here, but this was in uh, numerous books. Uh, Dr. Joe Marino wrote an 800-page book on the dating the Shroud of, Tar of Turin, and Manny Maranelli did as well. When they, when, when Teddy Hall, Michael Tite, and Robert Hedges of Oxford gave their press conference in October of eight, 19, 18, 1989 and claimed that somebody just faked it up, threw blood on it, you know, and or scourged it and threw blood on it. Within days, they received one million dollars. 1 million British pounds in pure silver for their fine work in exposing this hope. That money was donated from 40 Freemasons. And this is all documented. It's common knowledge, but you just don't hear it in the mainstream. And Teddy Hall retired fairly rich. He was rich to begin with. Uh, Michael Tite, who had been the former director of the British Museum of Natural History, he was given a new position as a history chair at Oxford. And I understand the hedges did some, went on a talking circuit. So, you know, I'm not, pointing out what their motives are, but people can connect the dots themselves if they want to gee, say, gee, was this really an objective group of scientists to be, we, and we don't have scientists getting paid off like this at the end of a study for thanking them this kind of work. So I'll end it there. All right, so Brendan, now uh, your five minute closing statement begins now. Yeah, so uh, to start, uh, we did get a little off topic uh, of the, the resurrection uh, itself. Uh, it's been a little bit more time on the shroud than I had uh, hoped maybe that we would be able to get into. Uh, even if I were to concede that the shroud were uh, first century, uh, even if I, which I, I definitely don't, uh, even with the issues with the carbon dating, right, the uh, the amount of contamination that would have had to have been there to get a first century date instead of a 13th century date is significant. But even if I grant that, even if I grant that we have no idea how the image was formed, it still doesn't prove a resurrection, right? And the major issue here is the proof for the resurrection. Uh, now, the resurrection itself is, again, claimed in Gospels that I do not find to be credible or reliable uh, based off of basic historical standards with stories that are easily explained through naturalistic causes and not uh, necessarily supernatural causes, right? Uh, those points I don't feel were uh, rebutted and still stand that there are easily naturalistic explanations for that. Um, that uh, explain the data just as well as the supernatural, except without you then also having to add the uh, presupposition of a specific deity acting in a specific way. Uh, at the end of the day, in my opinion, the strongest argument remains the fact that we can debate this, right? The fact that you can have logical and reasonable people who can look at the data and not come to the resurrection conclusion, uh, right? Because if God being omnipotent and all good and just and seeking to uh, know his people and have them know him, also this God setting up a system in which you are rewarded for knowing him, but you are punished for not knowing him, that omnipotent deity could have made any number of, uh, of uh, steps in place for the, uh, for the resurrection to be obvious, provable, demonstrable, knowable. Uh, again, even something as simple as the Bible glowing when you open it, right? Seems silly because we don't have it, but something as simple as that would pretty obviously prove that this is different from everything else that we have. It would end a lot of the debates. There are infinite number of ways in which God, if he existed, could have revealed himself 
could have made this obvious. And instead, what we have is a series of gospels that we don't know when they were written or who wrote them. We don't have the original manuscripts. Uh, we have some letters of Paul and some letters, probably not by Paul, based off of a number of criteria that the Bible scholars have gone into. Uh, we don't have, I, we don't even have the original manuscripts. We don't even have the autographs. And yet we are being expected to take them for their word in a way that we don't with any other historical manuscripts. Uh, people debate all, uh, there are books written on whether or not Homer even existed, let alone wrote the Iliad and the Odyssey, how much involvement he had in that. Uh, Josephus is critiqued all the time. We don't do this with other historical manuscripts, but we do do this or we're expected to do this with the Bible. We don't even do this with other holy books. We wouldn't take uh, at its face the Quran with the miracles of Muhammad. But we are being asked to do this with the Gospels when we're looking at this from a Christian perspective. Um, similarly, we know that people faked, even as early as the first century, people faked uh, artifacts, people faked things like the shroud, bones, uh, other relics. Uh, those we know. We know things are faked all the time. What we don't know is that there is anything to cause this to stand out or above criticism we would give to any other documents. All right, and Jim, your closing statement begins now. My, how, how much, much time do you have, Oh, you? Is it you? You have five minutes. Uh, Go ahead, you. Okay. You leave it to me here. I, this closing I, statement. I'd like, to, I'd like to address myself to the audience because it's really you who are important. <laughs> and I'd just like you, to, I'd like to invite you to consider the fact that you have just watched as Jim Bertrand has demonstrated that the evidence from the Holy Shroud in many different areas of scientific knowledge converges in confirming that it is the burial sheet of our Lord Jesus Christ and that the image on the shroud was produced in a supernatural way that would certainly be consistent with the return of his soul into his body. And yet, um, Brendan has dismissed all of this evidence and more because of one particular test, which Jim has shown to be totally useless, worthless, compromised, and of of no credibility whatsoever. And I ask you to please think deeply about that because it, it extends further. And I would just like to add that one of the things that hasn't been mentioned, which is quite remarkable, and there are others, is that Father Philas, an expert in this area, found the image on the eyes of the man of the shroud coins that were minted during the reign of Pontius Pilate. Now, <laughs> how are we to explain this? It's very easy to explain if we put it in to the context of all the other evidence that Jim has presented, but it's very difficult to explain in any other way. Now, what we've also seen is that if one is going to defer to the consensus view among the establishment scholars, of course we're never going to believe <laughs> in the truth of Christianity. This is obvious to anybody that's operates that's operated in academia. I went to what were considered the finest institutions of learning in this country. I went to Princeton University. My wife was in the first class of women at Princeton. Do you think that Orthodox Catholic doctrine 
ever gets a fair shake in those hallowed halls of academia? It doesn't. So of course, if you're going to follow the consensus view in establishment academia, of course, you're never going to accept the motives of credibility that God and the church have given us. But here's a very, very important point for everybody to consider. God is love. And as a loving God, God does not force us to love him in return. If what Brendan suggests were done, and if the Bible glowed every time we opened it up, that would be a sign of diabolical action, not of heavenly action, because that would be the action of a God who forces us to recognize his divinity. Instead, God has adopted a totally different character and has humbled himself to the lowest degree, even taking the shame, the pain, and the guilt of our sins upon himself, making himself totally approachable. So no, he's never going to give those motives of credibility. And those who say that they would believe if they received them never do. Emil Zola said that if he went to Lourdes and saw a miracle, he would believe. He saw a miracle and he remained an atheist. It's not how it works. And this is why faith has to be supernatural because it's entering into a relationship. It's like when you get married, you don't have proof that everything's gonna work out perfectly with your spouse. You make that act of faith, act of love, and that's exactly the relationship that God wants us to enter into with himself. I, I would say one final word. I think we have a different paradigm of reality. You know, when, when, I, when I pray the creed, I believe in all that is seen and unseen. And, and science and our reason, it, it handles those things that can be quantified, but there are unseen things that can't be quantified. You know, your mother loves you, the existence of God, those things. And so if we have a different paradigm of reality, then that, that kind of puts a block between us. And, and along with that, you know, science can never reproduce the resurrection, but, but that is a limitation of science uh, that, and not of, not, of, not of the resurrection. Yeah, I, I would agree. Our epistemologies are definitely, uh, or that, that might even be ontology, but, um, but I, I am open to the idea that there could be a, a supernatural realm. My, my question, as I uh, hope that I was able to convey, was it's more of the how, how would we know, right? If, if this were true, how would we know? Same question that I would have to ask if I were debating uh, a Muslim or a Hindu or a Mormon or, you know, anyone else is, okay, but how, how do I know that yours is the right one? Yeah. I've got these guys over here telling me that theirs is the right one. You're telling me yours is the right one. These all look kind of similar. How can I tell these apart? So that's the methodology that I try to approach with is, I think right. we'd probably agree. We'd probably agree that in talking about Islam, they believe because Muhammad said so, and that's you know, end of discussion, you know, for them. You know, we, we probably see that the same way. Whereas uh, with ours, we, we believe that God revealed Himself and that God can't deceive us. So that that's my different take. I don't believe it because Muhammad said so, but I believe that that, that God can't deceive us. Fair. Although interestingly, with Islam, they believe because Muhammad said so, and then backed it with miracles which is somewhat similar, I think, or at least I, I could see parallels between I believe it because Jesus said so and then perform miracles. Uh, now, I, I think the issues within Islam are a little bit easier to, uh, to articulate uh, and to find and point out, um, but uh, that's more of the benefit of the, the timing in which it was written, there's just, we have more documentation. The first century is a little bit trickier, especially with the destruction of Jerusalem and all of the uh, artifacts and libraries there and all of the information that could have been used later by Christian authors to go and confirm, uh, you know, it makes it tricky. 